and in this sub module we're going to go over the characteristics of glia cells all right folks let's get started so glia cells are also known as neuroglia they're found inside our cns and pns and glia cells are smaller than neurons but they're able to go through mitosis but they don't transmit any nerve signals. Their primary role is to protect and nourish our neurons. And during an early embryonic stage, they serve to guide the growth of the neurons to their final destination. We're gonna talk about the four main types of glia cells that are found inside the CNS and compare that to the PNS. We have the astrocytes, the epidemal cells, the microglia, and the oligodendrocytes. So we'll start off with the glia cells of the CNS and the astrocytes, which are these star-shaped cells, as a result of the projection that they touch different capillaries and touch other neurons. They're extremely abundant in your CNS. They have these extensions called the paravascular feet that maintain this protective seal for our blood-brain barrier. So most of the time, drugs and chemicals can't get through that layer. It regulates the composition of the interstitial around our brain. And it also contains these cytoskeletal structures that gives rise to strengthen the CNS. They're able to secrete different kinds of chemicals such as nerve growth factors, NGFs. This was discovered in 1986 by a renowned physiologist, Dr. Montalicini, and she won the Nobel Prize for that. These astrocytes can also add and eliminate any kind of waste that is floating around the environment and they maintain the fluid composition so that their ions are balanced out. The next type of neuroglia are called the epidemal cells. These ones are cuboidal cells that tend to have some ciliation. They're found lining the brain and spinal cord. Their main job is to generate the fluid called CSF, this clear fluid that bathes our CNS. Cilias are able to help protect as well as clean up the circulation of CSF. There is no basement membrane. The third type of neuroglia are called microglia. These are small cells that have slender branches and their main function is that they're resident macrophages. They engulf infectious agents. They're able to remove debris from dead or damaged cells. And then the last type are called oligodendrocytes. Oligodendrocytes are these bulbous cell bodies that have many extensions, up to 15 arms. Their job is to be able to form the myelin sheath. It creates a centripetal myelination, which means it wraps towards the center of the cell. And one of these oligodendrocytes can interact with numerous neurons inside your CNS. Let's take a look at the peripheral nervous system, the PNS. So the overview of PNS is that this is included in the spinal cord as well as the cranial nerves from the brain. The total set of nerves here include 43 pairs of nerves. There are 12 pairs of cranial nerves that come out from the brain. Majority of them are located inside the hindbrain and the pons and the medulla oblongata. And then there are 31 pairs of spinal nerves, and they're named after the vertebral levels by which they exit. So we have eight inside the cervical region, C1 to C8. For the thoracic, we have T1 to T12. And then for the lumbar, we have L1 to L5. And then for the sacral, we have S1 to S5. And then we have the coccygeal, which is the last one of the tail. Let's take a look at the cranial nerves. The cranial nerves are named and associated by these Roman numerals. And the order of the Roman numerals is based on the position and the origin by which it's located. So we start from the most anterior and superior and you work your way down posteriorly inferiorly. So cranial nerve number 12 will be closest to your spinal cord. The cranial nerve has some relation to its function. So for example, the name olfactory nerve means that it's related to smell. Cranial nerves are then divided to either being motor or sensory, or they can be a combination of both. So on the right hand side, there is a mnemonic for the 12 pairs of cranial nerve names. So it's 
000 to touch and feel very good Vegas and hypoglossal. You could substitute the Vegas and hypoglossal for any other word that you like just so that it sticks. In the next slide, I will go over the different kinds of function, whether they are motor, sensory, or both. So let's talk a little bit about each of these nerves. So cranial nerve number one, this is also known as the olfactory nerve, and the S represents sensory. Its primary function is to be sensory for the perception of smell. It brings information to the receptors uh, to perceive the olfactant molecules that you smell in the environment. Cranial nerve number two, optic nerve, this is also purely sensory. This is one used for involving of the visual input. Cranial nerve number three is a motor-based nerve, and this one innervates the skeletal muscle of the eyeball to move up, down, medially, as well as to raise the upper eyelid. It plays a role in controlling the extraocular skeletal muscles, as well as causing the change in the pupillary constriction in the shape of the lens. Cranial nerve number four is also a motor-based nerve. This one is called trochlear. Its main function is to innervate the superior oblique of the muscle. Superior oblique eye muscle. Cranial nerve number five, this is trigeminal. This is the first mixed one. That means both sensory and motor. And it predominantly maintains and receives information from the face as well as some of the muscles for chewing and mastication. Cranial nerve number six is called abducens. This one is also a motor-based nerve. It innervates your lateral rectus of the eye. So that's three of these 12 pairs of cranial nerves that controls just the extraocular muscles of the eye. And then it also transmits information from the region of those receptors. Cranial nerve number seven is called facial. This one is also a mixture one. There's many sub branches, but this one controls parts of your highway muscles inside your neck, as well as your stapedius muscles. And also about two thirds of your tongue is controlled by this nerve. Cranial nerve number eight, that's the vestibular cochlear nerve. This one plays a role for sensory information. It mediates the sensation of sound, your gait and balance, and it takes information to your brain for equilibrium. Cranial nerve number nine, glossopharyngeal, this combination nerve, it has both sensory and motor. It controls the remainder one third of your tongue. And it also innervates the parotid salivary gland in the otic ganglion to control that one third of the tongue to uh, salivate. Then we have cranial nerve number 10, vagus nerve. This one is also both sensory and motor. Its main function is all the parasympathetic fibers and the ANS. It also controls some of the pharyngeal muscles inside the neck. And it outputs to all the different plexuses like the cardio plexus, respiratory plexus, and so forth. Then we have cranial nerve number 11, accessory spinal nerve. This is sometimes referred to as cranial accessory nerve. This is one that is only motor, and its main function is to control your trapezius muscles, your traps as well as your stenocleotic mastery muscles inside your neck. And then cranial nerve number 12 is hypoglossal. And this one is also a motor-based nerve and its main function is to control some of the glossus tongue muscles. Over here, I have the mnemonic for the function. So they say, some say marry money, but my brother says big brains matter more. So S stands for sensory, M stands for motor, and B stands for both sensory and motor. All right, let's take a look at the spinal nerves. So the spinal cord is protected by these bony vertebral column, and each of these spinal nerves exits that vertebral column between the space called the intervertebral foramen. There are eight pairs in the cervical nerves that innervate the neck, shoulder, and arms and hands, and there are 12 pairs of the thoracic nerves, and they're associated with the chest and upper abdomen. And then we also have five lumbar nerves that are associated with the lower abdomen, hips, and legs. And we also have five pairs of sacral nerves associated with your genitalia region as well as your lower GI tract. And the coccygeal nerve is associated with the region towards the lower tailbone. So over here is a sample cross-section of the spinal cord. And each of these spinal nerves are arise from two points of attachment to the spinal cord. Uh, six to eight of these nerve rootlets emerge from the anterior surface and they converge to create what we call the anterior ventral root 
and then we also have the posterior dorsal root. All the sensory information comes in from the dorsal side of the spinal cord, and as it relays back out, it exits out the anterior root towards the muscle and the effector. The dorsal root is located right here. You can see it's a small swelling region. It contains the somas of many sensory neurons. The spinal nerve is a mixed nerve in which the sensory information goes via the posterior root and then the motor signals come out the anterior root. All right, folks, peace.